By the end of 1792, the radical Jacobin faction, believing the young revolution to be threatened by traitors and foreign intervention, are resorting to more and more violent means. But the Girondins, representing a more moderate brand of republicanism, want to curb the violence for fear it will lead to civil war. Their most vocal opponent, Jean-Paul Marat, strikes back at the Girondins with furious tirades in his newspaper, naming those he believes are plotting against the revolution. He had once called for the execution of 200 people. Now, he wants 200,000 heads to roll. When you look at Marat's journalism, uh, it's got one basic principle, which is be more extreme than anybody else and call for people to be killed. Um, if you look at Marat's uh, uh, journalism all the time, he's saying, if only we chopped off a few heads, uh, then things will be all right. And when things aren't all right, if only chop off a few more heads, things will be all right. Suddenly, people in Paris begin to massacre people, and Marat is the first to claim credit for that. But this extremism hasn't taken hold everywhere. In the provinces, many are outraged at the brutality of the Jacobin and call for an end to the bloodletting. Charlotte Corday, a passionate and determined young woman, is one such opponent. Charlotte Corday is an average person in the city of Caen. She's appalled by the killing that's going on there, and she, uh, perhaps rightly, considers uh, Marat one of the chief authors of that. He's been instrumental on the radical side of the revolution. His Ami de Peuple is still calling for heads. The 13th of July, 1793, Charlotte Corday arrives in Paris. She knows that the friend of the people has an open door policy at his home, where he can be found at nearly any hour, soaking in his medicinal bath. Corday arrives, claiming she has a list of traitors, people who are collaborating with foreign armies to end the revolution. Marat asks Corday for the list, promising that the traitors will be guillotined the next day. Having given him that, she then produces a poignard, a little stiletto, and stabs him uh, in the chest. Marat is dead. The self-proclaimed wrath of the people has been silenced. The revolution has its first martyr. When the revolution turns bloodthirsty, it's very easy to say it was his fault. And that, of course, is what those who hated him or feared him did say. And that's one of the reasons why Charlotte Corday actually murders him in 1793, because she regards him as responsible for many of the bloody atrocities that have actually occurred. Corday makes no attempt to escape. At her trial, she is unrepentant and proud. When the prosecutor demands to know what she had hoped to achieve, she answers, peace. Now that he is dead, peace will return to my country. Corday is guillotined four days after Mara's death. Her dream of peace dies with her. She has killed the man, but created a legend. Mara's death is most famously depicted by the painter David. He became a martyr. He became a kind of almost religious figure. You had people offering up prayers that went, heart of Jesus, heart of Marat. You had these scenes at his funeral where the bathtub in which he was murdered was sort of put up on the altar, almost as if it was a kind of crucifix. If you look at David's painting of Marat's death, Marat's body is draped in precisely the same way as the body of Christ is depicted in classic representations of the Pieta, the descent from the cross. So clearly there's an identification of Marat with Christ, with Marat representing the new kind of God of uh, the radical republic.